So let's get started now. So welcome to the 15 minute um, city concept event uh, organized by the Young Urbanists. My, my name is Julie Plechon. I am a Young Urbanist Steering Committee member uh, and I'm gonna be the chair for this evening. Uh, just um, a few uh, points of housekeeping before we get started. Um, the seminar is recorded. Um, so you, um, you're able to um, put your camera on and off. So if you do not want to appear, you can just turn, turn your uh, camera off. Um, we're going to mute you for the session, uh, but if you want to uh, ask a question, just pop it in the chat box and um, I will then invite you to join uh, once we get to the Q&A after our presentations um, and you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask the question directly to our speakers. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to very quickly introduce the, the speakers, but Florian is going to um, start with um, the definition of the 15 minutes uh, concept. So I'm not gonna define it myself. I'm gonna leave it to Florian who will do it brilliant, brilliantly. Then Hal is going to give us uh, an example of um, application of the, um, of the concept in, um, in, Port in um, Portland, US. Uh, Monica will um, explain to us how um, um, the 15 minute concepts um, can support the, the, the high street and its re regeneration. Um, then Simon is going to uh, tell us about um, how that can uh, support active be supported by active travel in Greater Manchester at a kind of metropolitan scale. And finally, Kirsty will um, refresh us with um, a bit of a non-urban perspective on the concept and how um, it can uh, apply to, urban, uh, to rural environments. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna call in Florian to get started. Thanks so much, Judy, and thanks so much for giving me the honor to define the 15 minute cities concept. Um, before I do that, I just want to say why I'm so keen to discuss this concept with you. Um, I really like the topic uh, for many reasons. The first one that I've, I've been living myself in uh, large metropolitan areas like Mexico, Bogota, London, and I really felt the necessity to break down these big urban monsters into more sizable human units. So the 15 minute cities concept is quite a relevant idea uh, in this context. And the second reason is that I'm from Paris. Yes, Paris is my hometown and as you know, Paris has been pioneering the 15 minute city concept. Um, Anne Hidalgo Paris Myers has made uh, it the core of her re-election campaign earlier this year. And I also really like um, Anne Hidalgo, but this is going to be for another discussion. Um, so before we start talking to you through the origins of the 15 minute city concept, it wouldn't be 2020 if I was not starting my presentation without um, talking uh, about COVID and how COVID-19 has pushed the 15 minute city concept at the forefront of the stage. So historically, uh, we know that density and connection have been like key features of cities. They have enabled civilization to strive, innovate, achieve economies of scale. But now, as COVID has shown, our desire to live close to one another has partly resulted in creating environment conducive to infectious diseases. So now the dynamics between COVID and urban agglomerations is even more interesting as COVID-19 has brought people closer to their local area due to the difficulty of you know, traveling, taking public transport, but also due to the restriction of you know, uh, going out within a, a one kilometer limit such as France has experienced during its two lockdown this year. Um, this is more of an, an anecdotal fact, but uh, I thought I would just like bring it up because it's quite relevant to our discussion. Uh, last month, I took a cab around the Chingford, uh, North East London for a short uh, cab journey. And the driver told me that he has lost all his customers that were traveling from Chingford to West London and had only now like um, short journeys inquiries. And he told me that he has seen his local areas thriving with more local people using um, the local coffees and the local amenities. Um, if you go to the next slide, Paul, um, what I want to sort of like demonstrate here is that this behavior and lifestyle change triggered by COVID have created ideal conditions to roll out the 15 minutes con cities concept and to define it. So it has been developed first by a French Colombian um, Sorbonne professors 
Carlos Moreno, which is the guy you saw in the picture before and the guy you see on the Twitter uh, page. And he defined it as um, the as the concept um, to which um, we can sort of like uh, bring back all the daily urban necessity together. Um, so all the things that you see on the left side of the screen, which is like work, home, shops, entertainment within a 15 minutes reach on foot or bike or by public transport. And originally what is quite interesting, and, and I work in this space, um, I work in the climate change like space, is that he has brought the concepts to curb Paris carbon emissions. And we, we imagine like Paris not divided into discrete zones for living, working and entertainment, but as a mosaics of neighborhood in which almost all residents needs could be met within 15, the 15 minutes framework. And uh, I also need to mention that he didn't call it the Ville du Cadre, the 15 minute city, he called it the cities of proximity. If you go on the next slide, I'm just going to talk to you about what is really new about the, the 15 minute city concept. And in a way, when you think about it, all the cities we built before the invention of cars were cities of proximities. Um, actually, the, the Danish architect Jan Gell get quite upset when he hears the concept as being a new concept because he, he undertook um, an, an interesting investigation a few years ago on the history and typical size of major European city centers. And what they found, um, he works as a team, is that, is that they, they found quite an interesting figure for, for the discussion today, which is that all the city centers in major European cities were one square kilometers, which is exactly the distance you can cover um, in 15 minutes according to your Google Maps uh, route planner. So basically walkable neighborhoods and villages were the norm uh, before automobiles and zoning codes spread out and divided up the cities in the 20th, 20th centuries. If you go on the next slide, you're going to recognize quite a famous person and a famous book who is like the American activist Jane Jacob, who's even in the same idea in her book, The Death and the Light of Great American Cities. And she argued that the modern urban planning has overlooked and oversimplified the, the complexity of human life. And she really advocated for a dense mixed development and walkable streets with her famous ideas of eyes on the streets, of bypass, so basically uh, helping to maintain public order, which is the principle I always think of when I lock my bike in any street in London. Um, my final slide in terms of what is new. Um, in terms of you know this 15 15 minute city concept compared to all the complex that have sort of arise before, so there's like two things that spring to my mind. Uh, the first thing is that the 15 minute cities call for a return to somehow slower way of life where commuting time is instead invested in in richer relationships, investing in what's nearby. And the person you see on the right um, side of the slide is Giuseppe Sala is a left-wing uh, mayor of Milan, and he announced in April that Milan would host a pilot scheme for rethinking the rhythm using the 15 minutes to this concept. And secondly, I think there's much more awareness of the potential inequalities to deploy such a framework, and that bringing everything to everyone may not be accessible for all the people who are part of the city, but this is going to something to be covered in other presentations. So, how now do we make the Ville de Carte a reality and what are the key implementing challenges? This is what Hal is going to talk you through now. Thank you, Florian, um, and hello, everyone. So something Florian and I sort of discussed when we were thinking about what to present was an example of where the 15 minute city or a concept like it has been implemented. Many of the discussions up until now have been quite theoretical. Um, and whilst Paris is pushing forward at the moment towards this 15 minute city concept, it's not something it's rolled out yet. There are two examples that are widely um, sort of noted, which are kin to the 15 minute city. One is the 20 minute city, uh, 20 minute neighborhood in Portland, and the other, the complete neighborhood in Melbourne. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about Portland. So back in 2012, um, Portland uh, published their Portland plan. And in the Portland plan, they published a, um, a goal to ensure that 80% of residents would live in a complete neighborhood by 2035. 
And this was one of what they defined as citywide measures of success. It wasn't a policy, it wasn't a overarching goal, it was a measure of success. And in my next slide, I'm gonna talk about how that fits into their wider policy structure. So this here is quite a complicated diagram, but I'm gonna talk through it. And it's, it's basically a, a synopsis of the policy um, structure of the uh, Portland plan. On the left hand side here are all the different bands of research that have gone into developing policies, which they've put forward. In the second sort of circle here is the three main policy pillars, which are thriving educated youth, economic prosperity and affordability and the healthy connected city. The idea is that those policy pillars are then delivered through initiatives, which are uh, carried out with um, private partners through public private partnerships, but also through the funds of the city government. And then these, the sort of effectiveness of those measures in delivering against the policy um, objectives are, are measured by these 12 uh, measures of success, one of which is the complete neighbourhood, which is a rename of the 20 minute neighbourhood, because what they really mean by that is the 20 minute neighbourhood. On the next slide, I'm going to um, discuss how they define that. So the complete neighbourhood, um, which in different documents Portland do reference as the 20 minute neighbourhood, um, is, is something that must satisfy seven of the factors that are shown on this screen. Um, three of them are related to transit and four of them are related to the provision of facilities across the city. So the three that are related to transit are that Streets that residents live on must have sidewalks on at least one side. Uh, residents must be within a quarter of a mile to a trail or a greenway and between an eighth of a mile and half a mile of a certain kind of public transport. Um, the distance required to be close to a bus is, is shorter than that of the underground, for example, or a train. Also required is that uh, residents must be half a mile from a neighbourhood park and three miles to a community centre, um, half a mile from a store, half a mile from a business or service cluster, which is akin to a local high street in London, and one mile from a public elementary school. And this definition was created before the publication of the Portland Plan. And what they did, having created this um, sort of discrete definition, was analysis on where neighbourhoods were complete within the city and where um, improvements needed to be made. And on the left hand side are, are three graphs which show um, analysis that was carried out on three of the points of the definition in the previous slide. And then all of these different analyses were combined to come up with this 20 minute neighbourhood concept analysis on the right, which shows many of the areas towards the centre of Portland are in yellow, whereas on the outskirts, they tend to be purple and blue. So they kind of tell a story that we know, but need to be shown that neighbourhoods um, are far less complete on the outskirts of the city than they are on the centre. And this analysis then fed into the type of initiatives that were carried out to deliver policy objectives, as well as the direction of where certain funding went. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about two programmes that Portland have carried out over the last um, eight or so years since the Portland plan. One of them is related to transit and the other is related to services. And the one related to transit is the Fixing Our Streets programme. So in 2016, a vote was held with Portland's residents. Um, to determine whether or not they were happy for a 10%, a 10 cent, sorry, gas te uh, tax to be levied on uh, residents' vehicles and a heavy vehicle use tax, with the idea that this, the monies created from this would be used to spend on maintenance improvements and on making the streets safer for cyclists and people walking. I've listed a few of the initiatives that fall under this scheme in the bottom. Many of these were pre-existing the Fixing Our Street scheme, but have now come under its banner. One of them is the Safe Routes to School scheme, which is looking at ensuring there are pavements as well as safe crossings between primary schools and the places where um, children live. 
um, and another is Neighbourhood Greenways, which is an, an initiative pioneering segregated bicycle highways. With regards to services, in 2012 revisions were also made um, to allow for community gardens and farmers markets to be anywhere in the city, which was quite a progressive move because um, Portland has a, a zoning planning system, which means each piece of land has a designated land use. Um, so this really opened up the possibility for um, community gardens and, and farmers markets. And addi addi additional to that provision was that if you were growing your own food in one of these community gardens, you could sell that food on site or off site um, and engage in direct transactions with the consumer. So they're really pushing this idea of homegrown produce within the city, which we often see in architects and um, planning students' drawings at universities. And backed with that was funding from the city government to actually producing more of these community gardens as well. And thousands have actually, thousands of plots. Um, so what we would know as allotments in the UK have been brought through uh, forward through that funding. These are just two of many programmes of implementation that's taking place. Um, and finally, just to note, I think positively, because the definition is, is quite discreet and measurable, Portland have been able to track their progress um, against the complete neighbourhood index over time. And they found that there was actually an increase in the number of residents living in complete neighbourhoods in 2016 from a baseline of 2010, a 2% increase. Um, that was attributed to demand for housing in, in Portland's close in neighbourhoods. But irrespective of that, I think it's just positive that they're measuring this over time. At the moment, we haven't seen that funding towards improving pedestrian um, and cycling transit and the even distribution of services. Um, we haven't seen that those kind of actions have increased the neighbourhood index, but hopefully we will over time. So thank you very much. And that ends Florian and I's uh, part of the presentation. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, both to both of you. Um, now we're going to uh, get cracking with uh, Monique and Simon's presentations. So over to you guys. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Monica, and um, so our presentation really focuses on, look, on how we can rethink the rhythms of our cities, uh, moving towards uh, micromobility and localism. So in the first part, I will look at the role of high streets in doing so, and then I will hand over to Simon, who will cover the active travel aspect of it. Uh, micromobility requires uh, high streets and town centers to to provide the services and amenities that are needed uh, by communities within local reach, with easy reach. And um, in fact, high streets are not just places of economic activity, but also the social and community center of, uh, of a neighborhood. Traditionally, these are um, of uh, particular importance to socially disadvantaged groups and, uh, and the elderly. But um, patterns have been changing uh, very recently. Lockdown has changed the way we use our, our local centers, but also how long we spend in them. Most of us have been, have been working from home, so it means that we don't need to commute to the center of the city. It's important, however, to remember that retail-dominated model of uh, the high street was suffering before the coronavirus pandemic and uh, this uh, this has just been uh, accel this trend has just been accelerated by by this uh, by the pandemic basically and uh, it seems <laughs> basically yeah high street really need to provide the the uses that are fundamental to those who live in pro in their proximity this is also one of the, the missions of the London Recovery Board, so the, which is to, which really focuses to the importance of um, a strong civil society to deliver high streets for all and fulfill the 15 minute city concept. I've decided to focus on the 
example of uh, Sutton High Street, which is in the southwest of London, because their High Street Fund focused on the on the delivery of community uses. So it, even before the pandemic, the the High Street was really losing out uh, to neighboring centers. So people, local residents, prefer to shop in in Wimbledon or Croydon rather than in the in their local area. And the, the I Street Fund bid had to focus on retaining local residents and uh, making the, the I Street more resilient to change and adapting to, to what would be the new trends for, for retail, but also new ways of living and working. So there are some challenges with the, with the I Street. So, um, it is very long, it's over one kilometer. And even if you, you can see that on the, on the slide, but it's on a, um, on a quite steep uh, hill, meaning that it's quite hard to get from one end to the other. Um, on the south side here, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, there is, um, there is the station and the, the majority of, uh, of uses of good uses are concentrated uh, around it. And the, the north end is quite derelict. There, are, there is a very high rate of vacancy, which is more than double the, the London average pre-COVID. And also there is um, a lack of, of diversity of uses. The, the high street is very focused on retail and shopping centers. And, the, and this is not, uh, it's not really sustainable in the future. However, there are some opportunities. So the, the high street is very well connected by transport uh, to central London. But so there, will, there is um, a proposed tram link that will have a station on the north end of the, of the high street, meaning that there will be opportunities to unlock development there. And also the, the council has a very strong uh, ownership of the, of the land around the high street. So it, that could in, encourage uh, redevelopment. This has been, um, has been explored in the 2016 town center master plan. And also the, the master plan looks at addressing the, the challenges that I've, uh, I've just described and has been the base for the, for the I Street Fund bid. Um, some of the, the majority of projects that came forward, as I mentioned, are focused around community uses. And this is to complement the growing residential uh, aspect of the borough. So with more um, residential developments and more younger families moving and living in the, in the borough, uh, the, the I Street needs to provide uh, more cultural venues and, uh, and spaces to socialize. So the bid includes uh, uh, food and drink spaces, uh, um, a music venue, but also um, workshops for local entrepreneurs that will be subsidized by, by a social enterprise. And um, this is uh, just, I just want to stress that the the, fo the focal point of this uh, of this example is that the it it the bid really focuses on on targeting the offer of the high street to to the local demography and the local needs and the by providing uses for the nighttime economy and the spaces for younger families so that the the residents don't need to travel to central London to find the what they need or what they want. And this would be, this is fundamental now that we are under restrictions, but it will be in the future as well, creating um, a sense of identity for the, for the local area. But um, anyways, now I will land over to Simon who will cover sustainable transport. Thank you very much, Monica. That was a really useful overview of um, what's happening practically in a high street um, in London and the changes that are happening towards a 15 minute city. 
Um, so I'm going to focus on active travel in uh, Greater Manchester, or sustainable travel. Um, and it's another essential part of the 15 minute city concept uh, by ena ideally enabling residents to access all the daily needs without having to rely on cars. I know that's something that's being discussed in the chat and will make for a good discussion later. Um, going to focus on the city that I live and work in, which is Manchester and the wider city region of Greater Manchester. When I moved to Manchester four years ago, a key difference I had experienced from spending time in some cities in the, in the Netherlands was cycling was such an essential part of everyday life. The cycling infrastructure ref reflected this with cycle routes across every city, with safe protected cycle routes on most main streets. You could see some ambition for Manchester to become a cycle friendly city. And um, you know, from my experience, one of the first significant schemes that I saw here was um, when Transport for Greater Manchester helped transform Oxford Road one of the key roads between the city centre and the universities of the city. Um, they installed protective cycle lanes to allow more cyclists on the road and giving them much more protection and helping make it a much more viable option to get around the city. Um, recently, a key driver of active travel is um, the mayor here, Andy Burnham. He created the role of cycling and walking commissioner in 2017, giving the role to Chris Boardman, who's a former British and Olympic cyclist and founder of Boardman Bikes. His first report was made to move, which detailed steps to transform Greater Manchester by changing the way residents travel. This had the really ambitious goal of quadrupling the amount of cyclists in Greater Manchester, as well as encouraging walking, and both things which were clearly complementary to creating 15 minute city. This was followed by the introduction of the B-Lines project in 2018. This is an ambitious one and a half billion pound investment to improve cycling in the region. At the launch, it was stated there was around a quarter of a billion car journeys of less than a kilometre each year, which is the equivalent of a 15 minute walk or five minute bike ride. So this ties it in with the to the 15 minute city idea to connect people with the essential services and places they need. So looking ahead to recent changes, um, some of the projects earmarked, earmarked for B lines have been begun to be implemented. These include a pioneer in Cyclops Junction, which is in the, um, the image in the top left there, um, which connects the suburb of Cholton to the city centre. Here, cyclists approaching a really busy crossroads are guided by their own traffic lights with priority over motorists, enabling safe passage through a busy junction. This was the first in the UK, and, uh, and these are now being introduced across the country as well, including in the typically more cycle-friendly city of Cambridge. Encouraging people to use active and sustainable transport by providing safe transport routes a better infrastructure is really essential to the success of a 15 minute city. Um, pedestrianisation of Deansgate has also been introduced in the last few months. Deansgate is typically tra is traditionally a main thoroughfare of the north of the city centre, but also a main shopping street. However, Manchester City Council introduced full pedestrianisation, or at least along most of it, um, a really progressive step to making the city more suitable for pedestrians and cyclists. This could have seemed like an, a radical and possibly unthinkable move in the past, but a very similar thing was done last summer by Extinction Rebellion, where the group occupied the road for a weekend, turning it into a car-free space, giving an indication of how the street could be used for the benefit of active travel. And again, this has reinforced the need to give priority to pedestrians and cyclists on road within the city to help connect them to amenities. Um, looking forward, there are certainly opportunities um, both within the city, but then can be for like for other areas as well. So looking great to Manchester, there's going to be further investment in around 30 more Cyclops junctions to enhance cycle connectivity. This is a really big investment by recent standards, showing there is ambition to better connect our neighbourhoods as well as travel routes into the city centre. There will also be further improvements as part of the Bean Lines project. These will include filtered neighbourhoods, which are neighbourhoods where the movement of people is prioritised over the movement of vehicles. Typically, this is achieved by creating colder style style access by allowing movement for people and for people walking and cycling. The approach creates spaces to, to like to both play and socialize, and enables more green areas to be created. And there are multiple neighborhoods across the city region which is going to be targeted, which helps reflect the 15-minute city concept of safe and easy access to amenities. And it's hoped that active travel will continue to be considered in major pro transport projects. One of the most notable of these is taking place in the city at the moment, and it's a large scale redesign of Great Anco Street. This place is focused on the pavements for pedestrians and adding in crossings where these were previously restricted. However, the downside of the scheme is a lack of cycle provision in the design. 
with and the, and as a result of that there's been a significant amount of protests from local cycling groups and residents. Um, just going to touch upon the challenges of this um, briefly. Um, there's a need for both for buy and for both stakeholders and policymakers this and to to make this a success. Um, as I mentioned, there are major transport schemes that have been designed without sufficient focus on active travel. Um, and there's a strong need to engage with stakeholders on issues like this. Uh, in Manchester, sometimes there seems a bit of a dis disconnect between what the city region is aiming to achieve through bead lines and plans being put into place by the by the individual district councils. And this has been seen recently where some of the temporary cycle routes introduced during the pandemic finished the different councils board borders rather than completing their journey to the city centre showing a bit of a disconnect between areas. Um, and additionally, funding for temporary bike lanes to support more active travel during the pandemic has been one of the positives to come out of recent months. However, there is just a risk for councils to effectively re revert to type and move away from these active travel measures because simply that's thing, how things have done before. And in London, this has been seen very recently with the removal of the cycle lane from Kensington High Street despite a lot, really large amount of use in recent months and a lot of vocal opposition to its removal. And finally, accessibility is really key. And there have been multiple reports highlighting the need for um, equality in active travel infrastructure. Um, recently, Sustrans and Arup produced a report highlighting that many people are excluded from cycling due to lack of infrastructure to suit all potential users. Um, and to wrap up, um, there's some key points um, that the threads that run between both of our sections. Um, it's important to ensure that schemes provide for local needs of communities. Um, it's important that stakeholders feel involved in the development process to have their views taken into account and satisfy their needs. There's also an opportunity to reimagine public space and land uses. There is a need to be more flexible in uses of cities and high streets, especially with the current need for economic recovery. The purpose of a city centre or high street it can dramatically change in a short period of time, as seen quite recently. So it's important to um, support and nurture such change to help build the resilience of spaces. Um, and finally, the 15 minute city concept can also be essential to connecting communities, helping create identities in a place, also help to connect communities physically as well. Um, thank you very much for those points. We look forward to discussing them in the, in the discussion later. Great, thank you so much, Monique and Simon. I think you know the, the in the age of uh, internal uh, internet shopping and and you know the, the the high street struggling, we need to really redefine really what what brings us to a to a town centre, what types of activities we, we want to be doing there, and uh, you know the challenges that Simon touched on in terms of the crispations around um, new cycle infrastructure and people not wanting to give up the cars is definitely something we, we should touch on, I think, during the discussion. Now, let's leave the city for a bit and um, let's follow Kirsty uh, into a reflection on um, the concept applied to um, rural environments. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, so um, in a bit of a contrast to everyone else's presentation so far, um, I want to take the concept of a 50 minute city and apply it to rural locations. Um, so where do cities, particularly in the UK, um, historically come from? Uh, it would be a, a series of small settlements that kind of merge organically over time and become a, a larger city. So um, what does that mean for our villages as we kind of look for ideas in the future and future cities? Uh, a lot of this is kind of based on work that I've been doing at Timber Design Initiatives um, and we've mainly been focusing in Scotland as that's kind of where we're based. Um, so in Scotland 30% of the population live in rural areas um, communities are very dispersed it's a series of kind of small settlements um, so if we were to take the concept of a 15 minute city and apply it to each individual settlement as a way of a, preparing for uh, the cities of the future to to come together um, this is a bit of an adaptation of the original 15 minute city concept diagram that we've done so 
how this would uh, relate to rural population. Um, and as um, everyone's kind of talked or covered are the key things that we need to have within a 15 minute city to uh, make it successful. I mean, that people are using it properly. Uh, there's a lot of these things that are currently lacking within rural communities. So um, an example that uh, is quite a big one is uh, the idea of healthcare. Um, within remote rural communities, you uh, can be traveling for a few hours to your nearest healthcare facility, whether that's emergency healthcare or specialized healthcare. Um, there's small GPs practices, but uh, even then they're quite far apart. So how are you, in a, if you take a 50 minute city con concept, then uh, remote locations aren't really hitting the, the points of it. Um, so what is missing for, for this to happen, for people to be in these areas using them correctly? Um, firstly, there's the problem of housing. Um, a high proportion of Scotland's rural communities can no longer afford to live in the areas that they are in. Um, this is even more prevalent now uh, because of COVID as uh, many people within the kind of central belt are flocking to uh, rural areas, which is, well, tier one, so they can do more, but uh, they're also deemed as a bit safer and less dense. So. Uh, we need to be preparing the rural settlements for this eventuality. Um, so how are we gonna build housing and facilities that they're needing? Um, large housing developers are really not interested in accessing remote rural locations. Um, as this kind of diagram shows, if you were to import uh, your systems from I don't know, Europe, it's, you're taking like 12 hours to get to London and then you're doing that again to get to a, a remote rural location within the Highlands Islands. So um, it's not really seen as financially viable, especially since the housing is so far apart and it's very small settlements. Um, so where do we go from here? <laughs> um, <clears throat> we've kind of been looking at a series of different uh, elements to this project. So a solution could be a series of small housing collectives where um, you're kind of buying into the vision of uh, this 15 minute city concept. You're, you're coming together, building a completely new development within uh, a plot that theoretically could have everything that you need uh, within a community that everyone's kind of outlined. Uh, this is an example um, of a co-housing down in London where a series of older women knew what they wanted to do and knew what facilities they needed and um, built them. So that's an option. Um, another option is to kind of take the resources that Scotland has and use them to their uh, full potential. So Scotland has a large uh, forest area in the yellow, especially in the Highlands and Islands. Um, and quite a lot of that is uh, suitable for making mass timber systems for construction. So at each stage of processing for um, mass timber, you are raising the value um, and also to a certain extent, the usability of uh, the end product. So if we were to use mass timber systems within uh, Scotland's remoter rural communities, you are giving them a much higher value item at the end. So our solution for that, um, since housing developers are not going to do it and it's difficult to kind of take everything from Europe and bring it over to these small islands, um, is to take the factory to the forest. So local manufacture of mass timber systems, in particular um, Della laminated timber, which is an all wood system, so that you um, are maximizing the resource that they have already. Um, 
another asset that remote rural communities have is uh, a lot of community land. So an example of this would be the Isle of Egg, which has uh, been community owned for over 20 years. Um, a lot of Highlands and Islands land, or um, a fair amount of Highlands and Islands land is community owned um, and it's increasing. There's a couple of kind of controversial ones that have been going around at the moment. Um, so some people might know about them, but um, a lot more of Scotland's land is becoming community owned. Um, so if you were to take those assets and empower the local community to build their own 15 minute um, city or their own 15 minute community through community based design, um, which completely integrates their needs at all stages of the process um, whilst also providing employment and a new skill set and general um, empowerment through the use of kind of a circular economy model. So if you're having these three assets, so you've got local labour, um, local skill force, community land and a local timber resource, uh, the, the best way to kind of achieve a 15 minute city would be to maximise these three and bring them together. Um, so the solution is um, a rural economy that's kind of self-sustaining so um, they're able to build what they require as and when they require it um, and then use the money that they're kind of saving and the money that they're making to invest back into the community, invest uh, into new forestry um, and new facilities. So the way that we kind of see it is if you're if you're looking at or, or the reason everyone's looking at a 15 minute city is to try and build more sustainable urban areas. But um, if you're wanting to build back sustainably, you're also wanting to involve community, you're wanting to keep everything um, at a very local scale, which is the whole point of a 15 minute city that everything's kind of walkable or drivable or cyclable. Um, and if we're wanting to do that properly and prepare um, our remote rural areas for an expand any expansion and even just to be able to sustain and improve their current way of life um, we need to be building that rural um, yeah so I think that's everything I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you so much Kirsty it was yeah it's really interesting to just think of you know how um, obviously, I mean, I think what underpins the 15 minute concept is this idea of density and how you can actually reintegrate density within rural environments. I think it's very challenging, but very, very inspiring as well. And um, in the Q&A, we can maybe explore like, you know, some other examples in Scotland that you know of um, where they've managed to like recreate more services and um, within com rural communities. So um, we've got uh, around 25 minutes of questions and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, I've seen uh, quite a few questions in the um, chat uh, box. So I'm gonna call in first uh, Team Porter, um, who, I mean, there was some discussion in the chat, but I would like to open to the other um, um, participants um, to, to, um, to, to discuss this. So, you know, 15 minutes city, but why not 15 minutes town? Uh, I think you were, yeah, basically discussing the different uh, scales, but I'd, I'd like to invite you to ask your question directly, if you're up for that, Tim Porter. Uh, hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, having worked in, um, I was just typing something in the chat there, um, in the same vein as Manchester, you've got people who, we did a number of in the housing association I work for. Um, we did a number of schemes um, in Harrow that were former TFL sites, and as part of the transport service, people were actually getting in the car to park in the car park, and they were actually living next to the station. So, I think we shouldn't underestimate the task of encouraging people to get out of their car um, and and actually make the whether it's a 15 minute town or a 15 minute city work. Uh, I think we have a lot lot more work to do in, in that respect, but I, I, I currently work in 
um, uh, the association I work for at the moment, we, are, we work in, in Hertfordshire and as part of some of the regen projects, it's going to be a real challenge to uh make schemes work because ultimately everything is driven by the car the planning um guidelines tell you that we have to put two car parking spaces to one home and ultimately we're going to end up moving from you know what is probably was it's not a very attractive scheme at the moment it's actually far more attractive than than actually just bit turning it into a giant car park. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose you know that is work in progress and to try and convince people to buy into car clubs and you know encourage local authorities to increase trans, uh, sort of public transport is is a big challenge. So I, I you know I'm, I'm hopefully in, in in a few years time once we've got our second regen scheme off the ground we'll i'll be able to come back to you and tell it it was a great success because we did manage to persuade people to get out of the car but uh, yeah i don't underestimate the challenge i guess b before i invite other um panel um and participants and presenters to respond i'd like to just uh, you know mention that very often we think of holland as this very very heavily urbanized country but actually it's not that dense in terms of urbanism. It's basically a dense landscape. So it's loads of like small towns that are very well connected with cycle lanes. Actually, most people in Holland don't live in big cities. There's all these villages and they're connected with these amazing countryside cycle lanes. So it's quite good to, you know, think of that when you feel a bit desperate about <laughs> British towns sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a positive uh, uh, sort of thumbs up. I think the case for, you know, real cycle infrastructure that isn't just urban infrastructure, but countryside infrastructure is, is a really important one to make. That's mm. my, my personal view. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I work around Lettridge and, and Hitchin, and they, there, are, there are sort of um, uh, cycle infrastructure, but it's much more, that cycle infrastructure use, is used for pleasure rather than actually sort of day-to-day Sort of activities so that people don't use it to go to work they don't use it to go shopping they don't use it to go to wherever they use it to just sort of stay healthy which i'm not sort of denigrating that that's obviously an important part of it as well but obviously it, it needs to to be you know, having invested in a lot of those cycle tracks it's you know it, it obviously need to encourage more people to use them yeah absolutely agree any um, of our panelists would like to? Um... Um, yeah, I, I can start if you want to. I have like many things I wanted to mention. So team first, uh, thanks all for your comments. Uh, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the sort of segregation in the UK between like, you know, using cycling infrastructure for leisure was in continental Europe, especially in countries like Netherlands or Denmark, it's used as like functional. Um, and, you know, as like commuting. So there is a scheme in Germany that was actually like, uh, they started to roll it up last year that was connecting like two cities um, that were, I think like 60 kilometers apart. And, and this scheme was seen, you know, for you know, traveling, uh, like bikepacking, but also for people to, to use it uh, more frequently when they have like, yeah, long travel journeys to, to complete. Um, just on the point of like uh, best practice in terms of cycling infrastructure, I, I wanted to mention a program which I think it's absolutely great. Um, unfortunately, it's funded by the EU. Uh, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, for the UK, it's funded by EU. It's uh, part of the um, EU Horizon program, and it's called like Handshake. And they allow um, mentoring cities. So the mentoring cities are, you know, big cycling cities, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, and Munich to train mentee cities. And um, Simon, her presentation like uh, was really did resonate um, to, to this program. So Manchester has been partnering up with Copenhagen to get some like lesson learned of how to design good cycling infrastructure. And Copenhagen had itself been trained by Amsterdam. So I think this sort of like partnership program could be really a great boost in terms of like extending and uh, improving regional bicycle infrastructure. And just on, on, the, on the last point, I think that you brought up as a team at the beginning on, you know, encouraging people to use uh, more, you know, cycling. 
um, and and also like encouraging people to do like carpooling. It's something that um, maybe Judy, you'd agree with me um, that I've been always surprised in the UK uh, on, on the sort of like the absence of cultural carpooling because carpooling in France is like quite widespread. And um, I was recent, recently in Grenoble and so how much the municipality has invested in infrastructure to allow people to carpool. There is even like an application and uh, some bus stop for, for allowing people to hitchhike, which was supported by the municipality, which I found like, yeah, quite, quite incredible. Um, so in my sort of like work where I'm helping local authorities to decrease their carbon um, emissions, transport is always the, the really difficult one to sort of like work, work around, especially that I work mostly in the rural areas. So this is like, um, uh, yeah, definitely a key challenge. But I think one of the solutions that Judy has brought up is to sort of like develop this, um, you know, develop a more polycentric model, such as the Nesodan, where it's not necessarily like about dense core urban centers, but around the networks of polycentric cities. And I have many other comments, but I'm sure uh, Simon, Monica, and the other would want to jump in. So I'm not going to take the whole space. I'd probably, before we jump in, I'd probably add another question in the mix and we, you can respond to Tim's or Peter's question. Peter has a question about, um, you know, is it about the town centre, is it about the suburb? And I think for me, it connects with Monica's presentation about the high street, what type of users do we need to connect people uh, to? So Peter, if you want to ask um, your, your question and then actually we'll probably for the sake of time take a UA, a US question as well and then I'll throw everything back at you. Hello there. Yeah I was just wondering whether it's, um, it's useful to, to make a distinction between a 15 minute suburb and a 15 minute city because to me they seem both very important things but almost do different things to achieve that because the 15 minute suburb is very much about walking. It's about things being within 15 minutes walk. But realistically, not everything is going to be in that suburb. There's always going to be an element of having to travel further afield, but then clearly with a, with a cycle or public transport, you can have a much greater distance in that in 15 minutes. And I mean, the British planning system makes a distinction between services and functions which would be in the town centre and, and those which would be perhaps more neighbourhood um, facilities and that seems to me a bit of a starting point in terms of thinking about what you would actually expect in a suburb within 15 minutes walk away but I'd be interested in uh, the panel's views on that. Great thanks a lot Peter and uh, US do you want would you like to ask your question? I mean it wasn't really a question by the way it was more like a, a comment on more kind of walkability but over to you. I'm not sure we've got. I'm not sure we've got. I think Judy, her mic doesn't work. Right. Well, I mean, um, if you want to ask your question later, that's fine. I'm just going to, because I'm conscious of time and so I'm just going to invite Nick Walkers to ask. Um, uh, his question about uh, the Glasgow context and then uh, we get back to the panel. Yeah, it wasn't really a question, it was more an observation, but um, it was just, uh, I'm an architect in Glasgow and it's always been very difficult within the city to um, get, um, I work predominantly in housing, to get housing schemes approved where we don't have lower levels of parking. Um, there's always a great pressure from local residents who insist on parking, uh, particularly within dense urban areas, um, tenemental streets where parking is um, problematic at the best of times. But actually, as, uh, since COVID, we've started to see quite a difference in um, the way people are approaching parking, including uh, planning, um, in that and there's a, a great... Um, uh, um, observation that there just isn't enough space for people within the city. 
So already things have started to change. And I think that's that's part of the issue really is, is, is getting people to see things in a different way. But together with that, the, the city council in Glasgow has got plans to increase the density of the, the centre, which is not particularly inhabited, the core centre, um, by 35 to 40,000 people within the next 20 years. So that in itself will increase the amount of walking and um, um, potential for 15 minutes sit, uh, city uh, because obviously we can't um, deal with that many cars. I don't mind responding to that, Julie. Um, there's two points there, Nick. I think the first um, with regards to parking, it doesn't seem like it's just Glasgow, but other cities around the UK too that are taking a different stance on parking. Now I know in the draft London plan, they're now expecting that um, super high density schemes that will be delivered in areas of high public transport accessibility should be car free, excluding where disabled spaces are required. So it does seem like there things are moving in the positive direction there. Um, and what you said with regards to Glasgow um, sort of pushing new residents into the center of the city um, struck a chord because what they're essentially doing there is bringing new residents into areas which are already part of the 50 minute city. They already meet the goals that you can walk to all your essential needs within 15 minutes um, and so on. And that's another um, thing that the Portland plan is pushing. They're trying to encourage new residents and new development in these areas that are already complete neighborhoods so that the overall population that lives within those neighborhoods increases over time while simultaneously trying to improve transit infrastructure in the areas which aren't complete already. So that seems to be something that's not just um, present in Glasgow, but elsewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, Glasgow is uh, an interesting case in itself because it was designed for a population twice the size um, and has been systematically sort of underpopulated um, through progressive um, uh, decisions. Um, but again, it all comes back down to footfall as well. So the more people you've obviously got living in the city, the more, um, opportunities there are for services to exist um, so you know the two feed each other so thank you Hal. I personally think that you know this you know like suburbanization of Glasgow has killed its center and now they're desperately trying to re-densify -re it's really tricky once the damage is done and that you've made everything rely on the car yeah um yeah, and I think uh, connecting the example of Glasgow with Peter's question, uh, we touched upon it during the presentations, but it's the suburbs that are actually lack are the less complete neighborhoods, uh, as I'll put it. So it, the services in these areas uh, are not as good as in the center of the city. So it's actually quite. Uh, quite challenging to bring back the footfall. And I think uh, there has to be a very high, ele big element of community engagement there, because we want, there, that needs to be a, the services that people need, but also that they want, so that uh, it's, it goes beyond just uh, the essential. And Monica, during, um, like through your research, have you noticed during COVID, like, cert like particular uses that have kind of been, you know, uh, needed more in the high streets? Like, you know, can we think of new services that people actually need uh, and that we can imagine for, for our high streets to be more resilient? Well, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is um, uh, spaces for, to socialize outdoor. So having, um, and so not just giving uh, back streets for, for uh, reclaiming the streets for cycle lanes and pedestrians, but also the spaces for bars and restaurants to have outdoor seating. And um, I think uh, that's the definitely the biggest part. I feel also the, as retail is, uh, is changing, there will be definitely less uh, need for shops. So because these are becoming more of uh, places where to stock uh, um, things that have been ordered online. 
Just a very minor point, but which is quite key, especially in my new life where I live in a town of like 35,000 inhabitants and I work from home, um, the need of uh, having space that provides um, office equipment is, is quite a big one. Um, so, you know, I was des desperately trying to print documents, especially that people are um, online shopping much more than before and they don't have access to the office. So anything that either provides sort of equipment or any space that does allow, you know, in future time in 2021, when we can like, you know, um, again, socialize any, any space that can be converted into co-working space, I think would be, would be quite key. And, and the London School of Economics actually has launched a survey um, on the future of knowledge centers, where they're asking, where do you see the future of knowledge centers? You know, if we're no longer going to central London to work, how, you know, how the sort of like economies of scale and how like knowledge economies are going to be shaped in the future in this context. Just to um, go back to Peter's question about if it's a suburb, a 15 minute suburb or a 15 minute city, I think um, if governing bodies and designers are actually gonna implement these principles it doesn't really matter if it's a 15 minute city or a suburb or a village or the UK like for for it to actually work within the UK it almost needs to be an overlap of all of these things and yeah the the way that they're implemented would be slightly different if it was a suburb way out of the city centre or if it's like right in the city or if it's in a remote rural location but the principles are the same um, so almost having to distinguish between the two um, defeats the purpose of the 15 minute city. The 15 minute city is supposed to make uh, life more accessible for everyone. So for it to be more accessible for everyone, it needs to be uh, implemented in no matter where you kind of are. I completely agree with that, Kirsty, because I think it, it's just it's stressing over the technicalities. At the end of the day, Florian's maps that she showed during her presentation showed what cities used to look like. And then modernism came along and tore apart our cities and geared them up in favor of the car. And the 15 minute city I, I see as just being almost like a rallying call to return to the way cities used to be. And it will be done through making sure there's an even distribution of services and making pedestrian and cycle transport easier. That's, that's kind of what, 15 minute city is trying to do it doesn't matter whether you call it a 20 minute neighborhood a complete neighborhood a 15 minute city you can stress all over all of these details um, but when it comes to actually implementing initiatives putting funding towards cycling and pedestrian infrastructure it doesn't matter what concept you rally around um, and the portland example was a really good case of that because they defined what a complete neighborhood meant but the initiatives were separate to that at the end of the day and it was just a way in which to measure their progress. And that's all this will be, it will be a way of measuring progress. The type of initiatives that take place will be the same in, in every case. And I think a, a big part of that is gonna be um, community engagement. Like a lot of um, local councils complain and complain about how no one in the community um, cares enough to turn up at the meetings and give their opinion, but they do. Like communities care um, so much about their their environment and their amenities but they aren't really engaged with in the correct way that is making them share what they need so if you're taking the 15 minute city concept and the the basic principles that it kind of relies on we need to be asking communities more what they're needing and then um that will be different between a suburb and a city and a uh, rural location but but the principle is that we are allowing uh, small communities to be accessible and have what they deem necessary for um, an improved or sustained livelihood really. Um, yeah what I find quite interesting with the 50 minute city concept is it's sort of a, a quite an intricate balance between um, not not implementing a one-size-fits-all policy but then looking at best practice at the same time and 
um, how there are some really useful examples out there, like the port plan's a really good one um, to sort of see how how it's sort of been well successfully implemented and how there's a lot of themes that would sort of connect and be very relevant to so many different places. But yeah, you, you need to really sort of engage with the community and talk to the community to actually yeah make sure that the local the the schemes are actually important and relevant to them do come to the fore. Um, I wonder if the the current move um, sort of towards online engagement um, it could potentially help that um, something that's been going around um, work for work for Acom a large consultancy and um, one of the things that have been sort of um, implementing recently is um, instead of having sort of face to face um, say consultation for environmental impacts um, assessments etc they've been moving to quite an online tool where you can enter say a virtual room um, and then sort of look at sort of different um, different stands effectively and sort of see how is this going to impact um, me in different ways if something like that can be um, can be utilized rather than um, you know people may, maybe or maybe not turning up at sort of physical events or or, or complementing physical events like if you want to go there and sort of have, have what you have to say um, you know in person um, but then if you don't feel as comfortable doing that then you can do so in the online portal um, hopefully can yeah can take advantage of a I don't know, recent recent developments and, and a recent sort of technological advances to do that. I think um, like if you're going to implement online consultations and stuff, I think it will in general be a lot more accessible <clears throat> because, um, for example, developments within rural locations, you're not necessarily like you aren't necessarily close to where the meetings are being held or um, in urban areas, the meetings might be held in a town hall up a set of stairs and you're in a wheelchair so you can't go and give your opinion or um, you don't feel comfortable with standing up in the middle of a meeting and shouting at the architect about why you don't like what they're doing. Like, I think online consultations are um, going to be really beneficial for how we develop um, more inclusive neighborhoods and urban areas and rural areas to, to talk about the other side of the coin i think i agree with both of you i think it's really important that virtual conversation uh, consultation um becomes part of the planning process but there are worries that lots of people can't engage with that type of consultation and so i'd say that I would have to go alongside existing consultation and i do a bit of volunteering through the organization Just Space. I don't know if any of you have heard Just Space, but recently in Hackney, um, I've been working with a local community group there who are opposed to a large development um, where the Tesco is situated. Um, they're unhappy that 19 storey towers of luxury flats are going to go up and they're trying to rally against it. And we together recently conducted a survey uh, where we asked local residents what they wanted to see on the site and what they didn't want to see. And we also did an online consultation and there were massive differences between the type of people that responded online and responded in person. In person, they represented the demographics of the community, um, which is quite a pure community in Hackney, whereas online, most of the people that responded had at least undergraduate degrees and I think about 30% had postgraduate degrees. There was a massive disparity. So if you switch entirely to online consultation, which I think is one of the fears of the white paper is, you you risk neglecting the communities that are really impacted by these developments. Absolutely. Um, I'm just really conscious of time and I'm going to give uh, an opportunity for Nicholas Major and Fabrizio to ask their question and uh, just give the panel five minutes to uh, comment or uh, respond and then we will bring everything to a close. Sadly, it's time to leave uh, already. Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Thanks for the presentations. Um, yeah, my question is really about is, uh, does everyone want to live in a 15 minute city? Because I'm aware that there's to some degree an echo chamber here. And obviously we all love density and, and diversity and that, everything that comes with it. But I see a lot of people that are really proud of their semi-detached houses on suburban uh, streets and their two cars and that, that kind of thing. Um, and I was just wondering, 
in terms of the general population, do people want to live in 50 minute cities? And what are the what are the challenges and potential opportunities of bringing people on board with with this? I think that relates quite a lot with um, what we've been kind of looking into with how it can apply to remote rural locations because you're absolutely right. Like, um, <clears throat> I noticed that you're also Scottish and in Scotland, there's loads of people that are living in small villages that are really happy that they're in their traditional uh, farmhouse that's been there for 150 years. And yeah, they need two cars so that they can go and do the shops, but that's where they've been brought up. And there's a, a huge sense of community pride within um, suburbs and remote rural uh, locations. So I think um, the key for implementing a kind of 50 minute concept to those areas would be facilitating them to create the, uh, the things that they need and implement the things that they need but at a scale and um, of a nature that is appropriate to the environment. So um, I think quite a lot of this talk has been about redensifying, but I think that isn't necessarily always the best route. So it's more of a kind of um, reproviding for these communities um, without necessarily needing to redensify. Like I know. There's a lot of places in um, the Highlands and Islands that are uh, derelict or need a lot of work done or need to be completely um, conserved. So like it, you could do that and implement a 50 minute city without necessarily redensifying and without making people feel like the way that they live their life isn't acceptable now. Um, I'm just going to invite Fabrizio to ask his question, if he's still around. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm very much here and listening to everyone. This is a fascinating topic. And my question is really more on the, I'm playing kind of slightly devil's advocate on the point of, you know, we're now living in a zero minute city. If we're complying with lockdown, uh, we're all staying at home and all doing everything online. And that basically posed for me the question of, uh, what is the mental health benefits of distance? Uh, many sort of anecdotic comments have been made on the importance of commute to disconnect from working and living, and whether the idea of 15 minutes uh, obviously is on a social infrastructure level uh, very, very much important, but at what point would uh, an increment of distance just for the, for the sake of having a disconnect uh, is also of benefit? Um, and I just want to know, you know, the panel's thoughts on that. Any member of the panel in um, in uh, you know in praise of distance and uh, travel? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a really important yeah point to make because I guess um, without really intending to, we have ended up with like enemy uh, in zero minute cities. You mentioned Britto and um, yeah, I found I've I've got during during lockdown, I've sort of got great joy for having to travel places further or, or doing it for rather than for sort of a mean to say, but for the, yeah, for the joy of, of moving and getting around, um, which has been quite a, yeah, quite a change from, you know, what, you know, wanting to get sort of quite a short distance from everywhere. Um, so I think, yeah, certainly there needs to be a balance between them. Um, yeah, it'd be good to have everything on your doorstep, but I think there's always opportunities to sort of go further afield and um, yeah, maybe over time sort of the, the, the reason why we travel to places sort of will, will change even more. For example, if, if we say don't live near a city center, rather than sort of just going there for work or say traveling to London, et cetera, it's, it's for pleasure. Um, and that might be quite a big change really. Um, Cause yeah, as much as um, on, you know, online engagement is, is great sort of sometimes face to face is, is um, yeah, really essential. Um, but yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's been a, a very big change in the last few months. So it's good to sort of recognize that. I think also that um, by allowing, by providing everything that people need, I think, you're right like a, everyone or a lot of people will still choose to travel for the things that they want to travel for 
um, like I know I read loads of books so um, but I live like a two minute walk from a bookshop but I would rather walk 30 minutes and go to a bookshop that I actually like um, or a smaller company rather than it being a Waterstones or the same with a coffee like if you live right next to Starbucks you might cross the road and go to a different one like I think um, by providing what is necessary for a 15 minute city I think people should surely still have the choice to be able to uh, move around for recreation rather than for necessity. Great. Thank you so much Kirsty for that. Um, I think uh, we're going to now bring this already to a close and it's quite frustrating because I feel like you know we still all want to say so many things but we can always carry on the conversation on Twitter for instance or by email or you know or do a second event even um, but I'd like everyone to join me to um, virtually clap and thank all of our speakers um, it was really great so thank you so much for joining us um, and yeah, I hope we'll um, see everyone soon in person or virtually. Um, and yeah, that's it, I think. Thanks to the moderator, Julie, and the organizer, Olga. That was really good. Yes, Thanks. obviously, praises to Olga for organizing all of this. And yeah, have a lovely evening, everyone. And it's, again, thank you for joining. So, thanks, guys. Thank you, Julie and Olga. You. See you guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.